everybody. Good morning. Everyone's very excited. Thank you. Really wonderful crowd. So I'm Matt. Um, like Valentin said, I'm, I'm head of design at SoftServe, so my teams work on all the things that we design. So um, our job is really to, to help humanize technology to solve business problems. That's, for the most part, what we do. Yeah, and my name is Yuri. I'm a data science practice lead for SoftServe, where I help our clients to emerge all these cutting-edge technologies, such as AI, machine learning, cognitive computing, and big data. So the interesting thing is, you know, what we see is, especially in the last year or so, a lot of the work that, that my teams are doing is in direct partnership with Yuri and his team. And so a lot of the conversations we're having with clients are about how does data driving the experiences that we're designing, how does that shape those experiences, and how does that lead ultimately to personalization, which we just heard about and we'll hear a lot more about um, later. So. I think today we wanted to talk, you know, we were talking about, we had this idea that we wanted to speak together about how data and design work together and, you know, how we have our working relationship and what does that actually mean. And we had a few, a few ideas, but ultimately we ended with this concept of talking about perception and what that actually means and how we actually will design for that and how we're doing it now and how we'll do it in the future. Um, so, do we have a... Perfect. Click. Next slide, please. So let's start with just defining a couple of things, because we can't really talk about reality unless we know what it is, or what we think it might be, I guess. So what is that? So what's real? So this is a definition of real. So for today's purposes, let's just go with it. Just, just pretend like this is accurate for today. I should say, by the way, we're going to talk about some highly speculative stuff today. So uh, just bear with us, and we can ask us questions at the end. Um, but we need, we need somewhere to start, right? So if we talk about reality, what is real? Let's just think about it from an objective point of view. So if something, we can, we can all agree objectively that something actually exists, then it has some sort of independent existence, then for today's purposes at least, that's a real thing. So this event, probably real, I think so. I think we could all probably agree that it's real. Someone that's not here that doesn't know about it might not know that it exists. That doesn't mean it's not necessarily real, or maybe it does. So if it is real, then let's just consider that it's a universal truth. So we're all going to agree, and we're all friends here, that this is universally a true thing. So if that's real, then let's talk about what actually we, we mean when we talk about perception. So what's perception? So if, if reality is objective, then let's just consider that perception is more subjective. So if it's my own personal awareness of something, and for you know, the sake of this conversation, let's consider how that happens through more sensory sort of experiences, then I have my own sort of reality, really. And so I think that this thing is real because it's real to me. So if it's real to me, it may not be real to you. It may not be real to Yuri. So your perception is different from mine, right? I don't know. I mean, I think we're pretty good friends. OK. So, but maybe, you know, I can't say that the way that I look at Yuri I mean, he's a very good looking guy, but he may look completely different to someone else. So I perceive him as a very handsome man. Chris Baker might think that he's a very ugly human being. I don't know the answer to that. I doubt that's true. So this is perception. So what does that actually mean? Letter click. So like I said, that's going to be a personal truth for today. So we have a universal truth, we have personal truths, and you know, we all work, I mean, we work in technology and design and, and creating solutions. And so we have to figure out, you know, how do we actually approach these different things and what are we actually designing for when we, when we do this? Are we trying to accomplish reality? Or are we really just trying to accomplish someone's perception of reality? 
Are we really just trying to create such a personal experience that it might be real to someone or something? So there's a good quote that we found on this next slide. Um, and it's, you know, I think it sort of sums up at least one perspective on this. And again, this all is very debatable, but for today, if you think about it this way, you know, this quote says that everything that you see or hear, all this that you experience, it's really very just specific to you. And that, you know, and there are many psychological principles about perception, and we can't be sure the way that each individual perceives a thing. And so it is really a unique reality for each of us, the way that we perceive anything. And so everything in the universe that you perceive is going to be specific to you. And so when we start to talk about personalization, which we'll get into a lot more, you know, that's ultimately the goal today, is to talk about how these very specific experiences are perceived by you and how your data should be able to drive those and it becomes very unique to you as a human being. Yeah? Good, I'm glad you agree. So, this is where it gets tricky. So you're gonna hear a lot of new words that you've probably never seen today because we made them up. And we didn't make them up because we just wanted to make stuff up. We were trying to make sense of how we can actually talk about different ways that people perceive these different types of reality. Because we really wanna understand how it affects our jobs and how can we work towards that now and how it'll affect the way that we work in the future. Do you wanna talk about some of these, Yuri? Maybe let's walk through all of them. Oh, that's describe. a good idea. So here are our criteria that we would like to use to evaluate each of these four types of perception or reality, right? So we, we consider two types of criteria. First of all, it's how personalized this type of uh, reality it is. And second one is how accessible it is, how easy to use it, how easy to achieve it. So by personalized, we usually mean that this type of reality knows everything about us. It collects all the information from us because we are all data. We have a lot of data that we can, that we can leverage from us. It learns from our data, from our decisions, from uh, basically everything that comes out of us. It adapts to, to us, actually, because we also we, we keep changing, right? It scales and it suggests, it recommends, right? And in terms of accessibility, we see that uh, uh, there are also uh, quite a few criteria. It should be autonomous, right? It should be seamless. We, for instance, our reality is actually seamless, right? So we, our real reality. It should be dynamic, instant, responsive, and predictive. So here are five, six different criteria and two groups that we're going to use to evaluate each of those four scenarios or realities. And so what, the, what that actually means, though, is that we're not trying to, you know, everything doesn't have to achieve all of these check marks. Right. So we're just using that sort of as a rubric to where we can go through and say, does this type of experience, you know, achieve these different milestones? And if it does, then we can start to put these on a scale. And so we came up with this way to sort of evaluate these and position them. And so what we're really measuring is, is where they exist on a level of high to low from accessibility standpoint. What that really means is just how easy is it to use. So is there an interface? Do I have to log in? Does it automatically know that I'm logged in? Do I not have to do anything? Do I have to go to a store to get a thing? Or can I do it online somehow? Is there a digital way? Is there some sort of business process automation that exists to solve some sort of you know, manual process? And those are the types of things that make it easy. And that's what we mean by accessibility. When we talk about personalization, again, it's mostly about data fidelity, but we want, also want to measure it from low to high. And not just about the fidelity of data that you're receiving, but more of the presentation layer and the way that the, the experience itself reacts to you. So if I am in a certain situation, you know, I don't know, if I come to this conference, for example, is this agenda personalized to me in some way? Does it know my data? If I come in, does the agenda change based on my own preferences? So those are the types of way we're going to evaluate these, these different types of experiences. And we'll plot these on this sort of, these quadrants. And again, 
I think it makes sense to us where we've landed with this a little bit, but depending on the way that you interpret these, they can shift around, and, but we're gonna show you today. We need a starting point, and that's what we're gonna sh show you today. So, first we're gonna tell you a story. Well, actually, we're gonna tell you, we're gonna go through a story with you through all these different types of reality. So, Yuri and I are best friends, and we love the Wild West. That's obvious. Um, and so today we're gonna tell you about how we can experience the Wild West in these different types of reality. And they're gonna be very poorly photoshopped, just so you know. So there's a reason though that these words say Matt and Yuri experience the Wild West. It's not that we visit the Wild West, it's not that we you know, learn about the Wild West, it's not that we see the Wild West, it's all about the experience that we have and the way that we perceive those realities and how that forms that experience. So we're gonna go to the Wild West. So let's start with real. So real reality. What's interesting is that Yuri and I, we have um, not only are we best friends, but our ancestors were best friends. And I think we'll show you that in just a minute, but let's first talk about the relationship with data and the environments and see how that actually works in terms of a very simple diagram. So here is a way we, kind of basic way how to we perceive reality. So we receive all, all, we actually all receive the same type of universal content, right? But we experience it in a different way. We perceive it in a different way. So this is kind of the basic scenario that we have uh, for kind of to, as a foundation, right? But what's important is that the content is fixed. Right. So when we talk about content, we are talking about the environment that you experience. Everyone that comes here will see the same content today. So you may all perceive it in different ways and have sort of unique experiences based on that. And that's why some of you will be very confused by the end of this conversation, I guarantee you. And some of you may be very happy with your arms in the air. And we'll find out how that goes. But the important thing is that it's, it's universal content experienced in different ways and that's you know, that's because it is a real situation. It's as real as it, it gets for us anyway. So the good thing about our ancestors is that they used to live in the Wild West. And so they know exactly what the Wild West was like. So you can yeah. see clearly that they know exactly what it's like because they were there. And so, you know, it's a personal experience for them and in, in that it, you know, it's real, but the main point is that it's, it's believable to them, and I think we can take this sort of scenario and run it through our scale and, and figure out where it actually lands on our, our graph here. So, is it accessible, what do you think? Let's look at it. Oh, so, oh, I forgot there's no transitions here. So, accessible, is that accessible really? Is the Wild West accessible? I can't really go experience what it was like during the 1800s right now. At least we have no idea how to travel in time, right? Eventually, we might. It might be accessible eventually. But that particular reality is not that accessible to me, at least in terms of as my own personal experience in that time period, experiencing it for myself firsthand. So that's the important thing here with reality, is it's a firsthand experience, and I know it for myself as, as you know, it's, I'm experiencing that, that universal truth firsthand. Let's go with that. So is it personal, though? I don't think so. We all perceive this in the same way, so it's not, I mean, that we all receive the same type of data. Data doesn't adapt to exactly. us, Exactly, right? it's important. We're talking about the data here. Is the data personal? Is the presentation layer of the content that you're receiving in the Wild West personal to you? Is it? For sure. No, it's not. That's why we're going to put it way down here. Really? Yeah. Okay. So that's where we're going to start with reality. It's our baseline, right? So is accessible, and we're not talking about, you know, I mean, think about the example we're going with right now and how we're plotting that. So it's the Wild West. It's not that accessible in terms of being a real experience. And it's not that personal because it's just universal content experienced in different ways. Can we do better? I think we can probably do better. Well, at least we can be more personal. 
Let's find out. So let's think about a different type of reality here. So we're calling this envisioned for the purpose of separating it from real. So what does that actually mean? So we, we actually can share our experience, right? We can, we can read a blog article about Wild West, right? We can watch a movie about Wild West, right? We can... I you can know. visit a website about the Wild West. Yes, for sure. But is it actually personal? It's more like biased, right? We still perceive it in a kind of our way, but we, we actually interpreting, interpreting mm. other experience, right? Yeah, I think it's more about taking someone else's experience that was firsthand because they experienced a real thing. And that, so it may be if our ancestors time traveled to here and then told us about it, we would be able to interpret their stories and have our own perception of what that is, but it's not real to us, right? For sure. Good. But is it accessible? Yeah, I mean, if time travel is possible, they can come here and talk to anybody. But, for instance, if we just go to the movie theater. Well, anyone can go to a movie. Maybe we should go to a movie and watch something about the Wild West. Okay, so anyone can go to a movie and watch about this, right? So it is accessible for the most part. It's not just about movies, it's about reading, it's about getting information. The accessibility of the information and the data is there. And so it becomes accessible, but it's not really personal because you're really interpreting, interpreting someone else's firsthand experience, right? Well, it's personal to some extent, right? Yeah, but it's not as personal as it could be. For sure. So let's think about where we would actually plot this. So accessibility is high. Just like we said, people can get it and people can experience it, but personalization is still not there. So we can do better, I think. I think especially leveraging the technology that we have now, right? All the technologies that we have. Yeah. So let's, let's see how that looks. Enhanced reality. So what is enhanced reality? So what if we try to leverage all the technologies that we have? What would be the kind of ultimate scenario that we have right now, actually? So we still can perceive the same universal content, but we can augment it with uh, big data, with AI and machine learning, right? And perceive it, I would say, in a more personalized way, right? So for instance, a good example of this can be your Facebook newsfeed, right? Every Facebook newsfeed is unique. There is no uh, kind of identical to identical newsfeed. So it's, it's more personalized for sure than previous scenario, right? But is, is it accessible? It? Well, that's the thing. So let's look at this. So we have a content, the same universal content coming in, and then something goes to the cloud, but how does it get there? We should, we need some sort of device, right? I think so. I mean, right now we have to sort of, we have to basically, I mean, even in the example we were hearing before, that was a survey that was used to obtain the data from something. So there's an interface, right? There are a lot of different interfaces. Oh, there's a lot. So the more interfaces that exist, the higher the friction is, the more things that I have to do and the more steps that I have to take to make a thing possible. And that's not, a, is it accessible? Yes. Is it achievable? Yes. Is it easy? It's, it's not hard, but it could probably be easier because it's not completely seamless. And so if we think about, you know, just the, really just the way that the data is flowing, it's going to have to go through a device, into the cloud, through something. Even when I use my VR headsets now, you know, I've got a Samsung VR. I have to take my phone and then open an app, put it inside of the headset, put it on my head, and then put headphones on and then try to make all this stuff work. And then I got to blink my eyes very carefully and accurately and point my head and do all this stuff to make it actually work correctly. And so it's possible. It's to some extent it's possible. It is accessible, but it's not perfect. So how would our Wild West scenario well, you're, like? Well, you wanted to ride a horse, right? Yeah, sure. That's why you wanted to go to the Wild West. So it's like your favorite thing to do is to imagine riding horses. We should get you on a horse. So let's see how that works with VR. Here I am, riding a horse in my own enhanced reality. 
It's not really accessible, but it's definitely personalized. Is it real? Do you believe it? I can pretend to, but it's not real. It's not, I still understand that there is some device, so I, I don't actually believe it in it. Hmm. I mean, you're holding, it looks like you're holding the reins, like you really thought they were there. Really? Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty real. Yes, pretty real. But not real enough. So let's plot that on our graph. So this is where we're going to put enhanced. So it's accessible, but still not as accessible as it could be. And, but it can be really personal, because we can go through all the steps to give it all the data and you know, put all, all of our own preferences in there, right? Yes, and it's interactive, right? Kind of my reality depends on the kind of decisions that I make. And it can learn from those decisions, and it can still predict. Use an AI and machine learning for sure. Yeah, but it's only doing that because you're giving it the data. You're actually taking the steps, going through some sort of interface or something, at least in this example, to be able to, to feed it data so that it can make it that personal. So that's where we're going to put this one. So then we need to think about what's next. So this is now. We can do this stuff, all of this now, really. You can go see things that are real. You can listen to other people's interpretations of things. Um, you can, you know, go, you can use virtual reality. You can go to real environments and enhance them with augmented reality. But it's all still kind of clunky and it's not really seamless, it's not autonomous at all, and it's not as dynamic as we want it to be. So we wanna think about where we're going, where we're going to end up, and we'll show you an example of that, but we need to start thinking about how this changes the way that we think about designing these types of experiences that have to do with you know, real business problems. And so we'll show you how that actually affects, um, or how this affects that, but first let's look at what we're calling intelligent reality. So you're the, you're the data guy. Why don't you tell them what intelligent rea reality is? So why is it intelligent? What makes it intelligent? So our, the reality that we kind of used to have, it's, it doesn't respond to us, right? It, it doesn't serve us. It's static, and only our perception is dynamic and personalized. But what if we take this newsfeed example and put it to the extreme level, right? What if every reality, every personal reality would be unique? What if reality for me would be, unique, would be different from your reality, right? What if we, we are physically in the same location, but we perceive different types of reality? Absolutely. Can we do that? I think we should be able to do it eventually, <laughs> hopefully. But what would it look like if we did it? So, yeah, so here we have yet another concept, internet of everything, right? So we do not perceive uh, pure reality. We perceive enhanced reality, reality that adapts to us. We do not have to make decisions. We, uh, reality knows what kind of decisions we might make, what, ex what are our preferences, what, what, what we may need or what we may want to achieve, right? So yeah. And the important thing is that all of that happens invisibly. So there are people that have begun to, begun to start talking about invisible design and what that actually means for designing all these things that are not happening without us even knowing about them. And so for us, it's very similar to the previous example, but the interface is gone. It's just happening. And don't ask me how it's going to happen because I'm not the technology guy, but it's going to happen in this world. And so the point is that our data is there, it goes to a place, it's processed and it learns and it predicts and it comes back, all built on a framework. So if you think about all the environments that we experience in our world, in our lives, just think of them as, we're calling it the internet of everything because it's just the environment. And it will serve as content. So everything that we consume in our daily lives, we're just calling it all content. If it's a coffee that I drink in the morning, that's content. And I, I know that's like sort of doomsday e, but for the purposes of this, that's what we're talking about. We're thinking of everything as content. The data is content. All of our environment is content. If you think about this as, if this was Google, it would be like, you know, coming to here would be like searching for 
shoes on Google and getting personalized content and ads served to you that is really just the environment that you experience. That's sort of complex, but the point is that it's serving you this content dynamically, autonomously, and it's doing it on its own in a predictable manner, and it's correct. It works, and you never even know it because you're a happy person. Yeah? Yeah, so what would be an example of such? For instance, let's, let's... Well, if we stick to the Wild West, does anyone know the show Westworld? You guys familiar with this show, this TV show? Maybe raise your hand if you're familiar with this show. Okay, Yuri assured me that everyone would be raising their hand right now, just so you know. Exp go ahead and explain it. So, what is interesting about this show, right? So, there is this kind of same environment for all guests, right? It's the same number of amount of hosts, but every experience is unique. And it highly depends on the uh, personal features of each guest, right? So. We have kind of a framework that is designed for infinite number of different experiences, right? Yeah, let's... So this is Westworld. If you haven't seen Westworld, it is a TV show. But the point is, it's really just, it's like a game. I mean, it's the same environment. It's, it's the same framework. And that's what's important here. If you start to think about these environments and these experiences as frameworks that adapt to your actual data that is input into them, and what comes back to you is the experience itself, and that's the content that you receive. So your personal data is going into this framework, think of it as a game, and it's coming back to you as a unique experience that you perceive to be 100% real. And it works, it doesn't break, right? It's because it's a game. No, and it knows what you want, and even if it wants you to achieve happiness, it takes you through the necessary steps to achieve that, even if there's struggle involved. Yeah. Maybe, possibly. But how can we achieve that? How can we get there? That's your problem to figure out. I'm just going to design it. Well, we still will have to design this invisible experience. That's true. So let's plot this first. So this is where we're putting intelligent. And so at this point, if the technology is there, it should be highly accessible because it should be seamless. It should be autonomous, it should be dynamic, so it's highly personal, it has your data, it knows what you want, it's always right, and it makes you happy. So it's the ultimate level of personalization, and it's obviously, it's a high goal, you know, it's, it's and scary in many ways, but we need to start thinking about how we would get there if we wanted to get there. So how do we start to design, you know, with the, the experiences that we have now, the types of work that we do, we have a lot of data already. And, you know, we have machine learning, we have all the stuff, the cool stuff that you do. We have experiences that are the presentation layer of that in many ways, and help people have different types of insights. And the problem though is that we've tried for a very long time to design experiences. And that is a very sort of you know, it's like having a God complex, really, for most designers, because we don't control the way that people experience anything, really. All we can do is create the best case scenario, and then their brain takes over, and their perception takes over, and the way that they experience that is highly personal to them. So, so how do we get there? So we're gonna make it personal and accessible. So we've gotta start thinking about everything that we do in these ways, right? Yes. Actually, I'll also add that machine learning kind of addresses this issue, right? So it's, if you're familiar with it, I, I assume that a lot of people are familiar with the concept of machine learning, right? So in machine learning, you design for some sort of a goal. You are not designing uh, some, some unique experience. You design a goal that you want to achieve. For instance, happiness. Whatever it makes to make, for instance, Matt happy, uh, machine learning can figure out, right? I hope so. I would love to be happy. So, let's... So, we're going to design for perception. And that's what you're talking about, exactly. So, if we're, t you know, we took the step to call this perception design from the beginning, so we're going to have to define it as something. So, 
this is what we're doing, and this is what he's talking about with machine learning, but we want to design flexible systems and frameworks. So we're not trying, we have to stop trying to make things so personal for individuals and start thinking more about what kinds of systems can we actually design that can take that content and, or take the data and dynamic, dynamically produce very relevant and personalized content. And we're talking, you know, going farther than, and I'm, I'm, it was great to see a, a talk about personalization before this, but we're talking about going much farther than that. And so we have to start, stop, start, stop trying to think about specific experiences and start thinking about infinite numbers of experiences of personal truths. We can't design those personal truths, but we can design the frameworks that allow those to exist. And that's where we're trying to get. So, stop trying to design a personal experience and start designing for infinite personal experiences. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Matt.